Hi everybody, uh, welcome to week 27 of ENM 2020. I am sorry that I missed last week, but I got in, believe it or not, four days of field work. Uh, basically the first three nights that I spent outside of my house since early March. So it really was a, a nice experience, but I did miss you guys terribly. And I was, I was crying all, all last Friday morning. <laughs> um, anyhow, we're in week 27. We're talking about model transfers. Um, have Enrique Martinez, uh, Hannah Owens, Mona Papij, and Marlon Cobos. Uh, I feel like I'm introducing the personalities on a, on a game show. <laughs> You'd have an interesting yeah. fact about each of us as well, though. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, let's see, interesting fact. Enrique oh. says he plays ping pong really, really well, but nobody believes him. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's look at some questions. There we go. Here we are in the course. With this week, we're finishing up model transfers. And next week, we start into model comparisons. Um, so we'll do two weeks on model comparisons. We've got an introduction that Marlon and Jorge Soberon, I'm sure, are hard at work on. Then we've got a presentation from Dan Warren. And then I hope from, from Antoine Guisan and Olivier Brenneman and um, some, some other presentations. So we're gonna be talking model comparisons. Then there's gonna be a really neat week spent on repeat, repeatability of models. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of a neat science question about how do you take this, this complex series of steps that has taken 28 weeks to describe in a course and how do you summarize it in a, what, a two-page method section so that somebody can repeat and replicate your work exactly? Then we're going to talk about abundances and then into frontiers, and then we're done. So uh, we really are closing in on the end of the course. Okay, so questions for this week. Uh, Hannah was, it looks like Enrique as well, but Hannah and Enrique went through and um, put in some answers to questions. So thanks a lot, guys, for that. I already uh, produced this as a PDF and stuck it uh, as additional materials on the course page. So people, if you're interested in seeing uh, Hannah's and Enrique's answers to questions, you just go here um, and you can see a PDF of, of the answers they put up. Okay, what questions would people like to take on? Anna, you signaled this one on 2716, and this may be a good one for us to discuss. So, well, yeah, and so I chose that, that question because, um, well, there are two of us that were co-authors on the MOP paper. And so it might be beneficial to discuss. Um, so the question, if you can't read the screen, uh, for those of you that are watching the video, it says, uh, as MOP represents the multivariate distance from each cell to a cloud of points, would we have a better representation of conditions the more variables we add, or will we have an overfitting problem? I understand MOP can give a more realistic and less extreme extrapolation than the other mechanisms, but we are still constrained to the information we work with. Uh, so there's a little bit to parse there. Um, first of all, I would say that MOP doesn't give you a more, I, I wouldn't say it gives you a less extreme extrapolation than the other mechanisms. It just gives you a different estimate. Um, it's, it's looking at the full, uh, like it's looking at all of eSpace instead of looking at each individual environmental variable separately and only choosing the one that's the most extreme when it's doing its estimation, which is what MESS does. Um, so that's that. As for um, how many environmental variables you add, you should really only be doing it with the, the 
variables that you're using when you train your model and then transfer your model. If you add, if you tried adding additional variables, you're really not getting at um, the realities of what the model is doing because we're interested in the model transfer and not necessarily other things. I mean, you could use, I mean, I guess you could use MOP without doing a model transfer just to see how different two environments are, but yeah. So, so I, I think one thing to point out is that the distances in MOP, those MOP distances are not in any set of units. Right. And so, yeah, it's true. If we add, if we were to look at a very highly dimensional space versus a very low dimensional space, the distances would be greater. Mm -hmm but the numbers are relative. And so we never say, oh, you know, there's a mop distance of 5.2, so we should not extrapolate, we should not transfer to those conditions. Rather, for any given mop, we just look at the distribution of the distances and the highest distances we say are more extrapolative than the lowest distances. Yeah. So. I don't see an overfitting problem or a dimensionality problem because we're just interpreting those non out of range, those non strictly extrapolative distances. We're only interpreting them relatively and not absolutely. Yeah. Now this, this there's another question that I highlighted somewhere else, uh, which was, MOP versus MESS versus XDET. And I think that's what Emilio is referring to in the last sentence where, where he mentions then other mechanisms. And I think I, it is really important to point out that there's a qualitative difference between MOP and MESS versus XDET. So right. MOP versus MESS and XDET. Mm -hmm. The qualitative difference is that uh, we are I've been trying to take us back to faces. I always forget. The qualitative difference is that MOP develops comparisons to the nearest part of a cloud rather than to the central part of the cloud. So let's imagine in environmental space, we have one point and we're interested in whether it's extrapolative and we're comparing it to some environmental cloud that might be a, a reference region or a calibration region or something like that. Well, comparing to the centroid, we get this distance. But whether or not that is extrapolative depends on how big the cloud is. If the cloud is small, then that distance is meaningful. But if the cloud is huge, then our point and the conditions presented there may not be extrapolative at all. Mm -hmm. And so the real key difference between MOP and the other two methods is that MOP gives you an idea of the distance to the nearest part of that cloud. And the nearest environmental part of that space, cloud right? might be right here if the cloud is huge. Mm -hmm or the nearest part of the cloud might be all over here far away if the cloud is small. So to me, that responds much more clearly to the question of extrapolativeness of a transfer than do the other two methods. And you know, I'd, I'd be happy to debate that with the proponents of the other methods, but to me, it's a qualitative difference and it means something. It's, it's important because we all know environmental space is not uniform. It's not regular. So the borders of the cloud of points in M usually have very strange and like non-uniform borders. When you use a metric that doesn't consider those borders, then you may end up assuming a point that is actually non-analogous to your M is similar because it fails in one of the uh, like concavities of the borders of your M. 
and compared to the other points is more is closer. Uh, and actually, it's not analogous because it's not there. It's not in your M. And that's the importance of doing it in multivariate space and also in considering the, the borders of that region, of the M region. And I guess XTET also considers a border, but it's an ellipsoidal border. And it's yeah. still, it's a convex form. It's not the same as the irregular form in the M. And it, it is interesting in, in the products it gives you because they allow you to do some interpretation, but that ellipsoid is not, is not a good representation of the very irregular space that the M can be. So it might be a little bit unfair to the proponents of those other methods because I think we all are mostly agree on on MOP, but you know I, I think that's a, that's a thing to think about that that you can't represent an environmental space with a convex um, representation because we know that that these these environmental spaces, in contrast to niches environmental spaces can be extremely complicated and irregular and also just whatever the the measure of extrapolativeness ask yourself is it measuring the distance to a central point or is it measuring the distance to the nearest points it's very important okay let's jump to another question there are some uh specific questions for some of us so let me which one let me take one that it's uh, for me which number which is a uh, number the line number is 2684 and uh, 85 is the same person francisco that one yeah okay so you as a researcher it's kind of the same question and I think Francisco hit return too quickly. When you are requested as a peer reviewer, what is the best way to represent, um, I, I'm gonna interpret the point that I've chosen to, in, to present only the models that make sense. Yeah, something, something like that. Well, uh, I think a good exercise for, for you to realize what makes sense and what doesn't make sense is to, to test several algorithms and, and project them. And you will see that uh, some algorithms just don't do a, a good work at projecting your, your model. Uh, and you will see crazy things. And you can say, well, saying makes sense or not makes sense is, is subjective, but you have to see it to, to understand what does make sense and what doesn't. But uh, my, my recommendation is that you test several algorithms and you can see that, that uh, effect. And we, we um, pretty commonly, I think we do kind of a, a post modeling filtering, but instead of just saying makes sense, we might make a list of qualities. Like for example, we're finishing up a paper in my lab group that's on an invasive hornet. And it has just a, a few known invasive populations. And so calibrating on the native range, transferring to the potential invaded range, we only wanted to consider the models that showed suitability in the places where there are invasive populations that have at least survived a winter. And so we state very clearly that we do all the filtering in our model selection, and then we further filter by asking which of these models include the known invasive populations. That's one dimension of making sense. Or, you know, that don't include deserts. Or, you know, you could, you could, you could very clearly state qualities that make sense to you. And I think so long as those are stated factually, 
and clearly in your methods, I don't think that your reviewers are going to react poorly to that. What, what we don't want to see as peer reviewers is a statement like, we eliminated all of the mod all of the model projections that didn't make sense. That's fine. Because then that's basically saying, I produced a bunch of models and I interpreted the ones that I liked. But I think if there are good biological reasons for the specific criteria that you use behind, you know, making sense, then I think you're going to be fine. There is this uh, young researcher from here in Mexico, Lázaro Guevara. He's doing a very interesting research on selecting variables and, and uh, making more realistic projections across time. I recommend his, his papers because he, he gives very good examples on how variables produce uh, models that that feed the biology of all the species that he works with. If you can send me PDFs of those papers, I'll put them on the course page. I did, I did, I, I sent you the, those ah, papers. So they're in the additional materials packet for Enrique's talk. Good, so read those papers, people. Another question, Hannah something? Um. I thought I highlighted some, yeah, I had highlighted something in gold maybe, but it's, yeah, I don't see it anymore. Yeah, I, may, I may have lost that. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Uh... This is a tough one if, if, if I can jump in. Yeah. Which one? 2689. 2689? Yeah. Okay. My name is David. My question for, is for Enrique about the first talk. In the case of assumptions, you talk about the consideration of a static niche or a static relationship between environmental factors and species distributions, I assume. To consider changes in any of these assumptions, we can take data from different periods in the past and estimate each of them to see if there's a trend in this change to make a more accurate prediction of future scenarios, considering how any of both assumptions niche an environment species relationship according to this trend. Hmm. It's interesting because it's, it's not easy to test if there is a changing relationship between the niche of the species and the environment in a long time. Isn't the niche of the species just a subset of environmental space? Yeah. So in that sense, aren't we just talking about niche comparisons and testing niche similarity between past and present and present and future or, or something like that? Mm. I'm not sure. It, it, what, what I understand in the question is that uh, more uh, related to, to evolution of, of the niche a long time regarding one of the variables. If one species, for example, is becoming more tolerant to, to uh, warmer weather, so warmer climates or, or, or not a long time, but how, how can you test that? Well, if you have an explicit phylogeny, um, there is a Recent paper by Owens et al., somebody near, <laughs> near to our <laughs> heart. Uh, no, Hannah just le led a, 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 a neat paper. I think it's neat. I'm a co-author, so I'm, un I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, it, what, what we've done is to take niches and put them onto phylogenies and ask, how do the niches change over phylogeny? That's been happening for years. People have been doing that for years. But what we've done in this paper is to include explicitly consideration of uncertainty in the niches. So if you guys think about the difference between the existing niche and the fundamental niche, 
The existing niche is the part of the fundamental niche that is represented within M, right? And sometimes our existing niche butts up against the limits of the environments manifested within M. And so we don't know where the fundamental niche ends, right? We know that maybe our species is present up to 20 degrees centigrade, but we don't know whether our species will find you know, 24 degrees centigrade suitable as well. And so what we've done in this paper, I'll put it in the, in the additional materials, but what we've done in this paper for the first time is to include uncertainty in the reconstructions of ancestral niches. And what that does is it reduces the amount of evolutionary change that you reconstruct because you're approximating change in fundamental niche when Sorry, Marlon's a co-author on the paper as well. Sorry, Marlon. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's horrible when you have this thought halfway through a sentence. Like, oh, Tony, you screwed up again. Anyhow, um, we're taking that. Uh, if, you, if you reconstruct the evolution of existing niches, then you are looking at changes in the fundamental niche, but also changes in the representation of environments across different M areas. And so that's a lot of non-evolution of fundamental niche that looks like evolution of fundamental niche. And what we've done in this method is those differences between existing and fundamental niche, we've essentially flagged those as I don't know, and we don't over-interpret those. So the only conclusions we make about evolution of fundamental niche are the ones that are based on evidence in the data. Anyhow, it's a method. I'll put it out there in the in the um, in the matrix for the course. But you know, but I understood this question a little bit different. <laughs> I think more like what uh, Enrique understood. I understand that this person is interested in see whether the niche of the same species can be considered as changing towards the time. And I guess that has different ways in which you can see it, but each of those have like different and probably more complicated questions depending on uh, how long ago you wanna see because you can have like very past, like from very, very uh, old uh, records, like from prehistoric times. And that has a complication that you are never sure about like sampling. Uh, is it complete? Is it enough to represent the species niche? Is it a good representation of what was the distribution at that time? And then you're never sure whether you're reconstructing completely or not. You're never sure about that it's even worse in that sense. And if you're seeing it as a question that is more about decades, uh, or sometimes I've seen this even years, it's also a question about uh, sampling again. Like you never go in one decade and sample everything, at least for most of the species. And then if that's true, you cannot compare something that is incompletely represented with something else that is also incompletely represented. And if we add, if we add the complication in that, let's say climate, climate has changed and then this has more like warmer, this has warmer temperatures and this has colder temperatures. Uh, you first have to recognize whether these warmer conditions existed or not in this previous area. If it, doesn't exist, then you cannot assume change. You cannot assume that the species niche has changed, even though you are reconstructing a warmer niche. And so there, there are multiple complications. And I, I, I have read some papers about it. I have reviewed some papers about it. And that's always my, my concern. The other thing is that 
uh, Jorge and Town published recently a paper in which they recognized that some stages of the development of a species, of, of individuals of a species, may have different niches. Then, depending on what species and the regions also of the earth, you may have very different niches for seeds than for adults or plants. And that could happen as well with some animals. I cannot see an example right now, but it could. Nesting, uh, larvae, and eggs, and stuff like that. Yeah. And then all of that is also complicated. I just I just want to mention that because if you would really want to explore whether the niche of a species has changed in a period of time, you have to take care about all these things. But I think what it comes down to, and we're going to see this when we do niche comparisons starting next week, what it comes down to is evidence. And the, the only evidence that for me reflects changing niche is if I see one species or one time period, a species in one time period, or even a species in one region where it uses these conditions but has available all of these conditions, which is to say these conditions are within M, but it only uses these. And then if I see it somewhere else using these conditions that are accessible to the species and not used, that to me is direct evidence, data-based evidence of niche change. Now, of course, it means you have to estimate M right. It means you have to understand the physiological and consequently niche requirements of all of the life stages, as you said, Marlon. It means you have to understand the conditions manifested at the moment that the species is experiencing them. We're going to hear a talk later on from Kate Ingenloff about that. But what it all comes down to is if you can show that one species has this set of conditions available and accessible to it and does not use it, then that's a very interesting case. That's something that points to either the niche has changed or the biotic environment has changed assuming you have your accessible area correctly delineated. Or it's a matter of time. It's only with, it, with more time, it, it can access them. Well, that, that just means you specified your accessible area for that moment. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, it's, it's in, in not equilibrium with the environment. Yes. What I mean. I was also going to say that it's a big assumption to make. Even if you, if you take care of all the possible pitfalls that Marlon and Dawn uh, and Enrique mentioned, assuming, I mean, let's say everything is perfect, data are perfect, understanding of physiology is perfect, and, and species is at, is at equilibrium, this idea that you can take a trend of change between past and present and just apply it to future, to me seems like a big assumption because the evolutionary trajectory from past to present doesn't, doesn't mean that the species will follow the same trajectory into the future. So I think it's really hard to, to make that extrapolation, that, that projection of trend of change from what I've observed into the future. And that, and that kind of verges on a whole different set of transfer related questions. And there was one question about this, about whether transferring to the past and transferring to the future go together. And then I see it very frequently where, where somebody will say, I'm interested in the historical geography of this species and I'm going to look at the future geography as well. Yeah, and I just throw out there that they're really qualitatively different. 
Because if you look from the present back into the past, what temperatures have been done have done is they've been as warm as they are now or qualitatively colder during the, the glacial periods. And so back into the past, temperature goes <laughs> like this, right? But it never goes higher than present or never goes markedly higher than present. But if you go from present into the future, it's clearly going higher. And so past refugia are reflecting cold tolerance. Mm -hmm. Future refugia would be reflecting heat tolerance. And those are very, very different things. And they are probably not going to be coincident. Yeah, but uh, what if you start in the past and go to the present and then go to the future? Start in the past, meaning last glacial maximum. No, no not necessarily. That's, that's, uh, that, there's a problem of data if you go to the fossil record. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, there's this go from, paper about mammal distributions in the Pleistocene. I don't remember who the yeah. lead author was, Enrique. <laughs> but if I remember right, they were able to put together for close to last glacial maximum, I think it was five to seven occurrences for each of the species they studied. And, and two environmental variables. <laughs> Everybody, that was Enrique's doctoral dissertation chapter. <laughs> novel at its time <laughs> it was it was a cool paper it still is a cool paper it's just we could do better now yeah and there are folks that have tried doing it with uh scoloporous lizards as well so a lot of the work that michelle law i say is it michelle lawing that's done that i think it's l-a-w-i-n-g so folks if you want to if you want to google it but yeah she's got at least two papers out um or one of which she's not the first author, but um, yeah, doing, yeah, basically doing slices for uh, several species of Scoloporus in North America and looking back into the past at, and then based on that, trying to extrapolate into the future. Hmm. But yeah, there's another, there was another question on here too, I think that was asking, um, like on the list of questions that was asking about whether it was, I don't remember which question it was, but something about it being more extrapolative to go into the future than into the past, but I had kind of understood it more in the con in the in the context of, yeah, being able to ground truth things um, for uncertainty. It was something that I actually responded to, but I don't. So I responded to it. We don't have to talk about it, but yeah. But that's that's come up more than once in the the, the span of the questions. It, it is an interesting point because you know if you talk about a species that is existing presently and was present at last glacial maximum, those are both sets of conditions that that species probably experienced 25 different times during the Pleistocene, which is to say in the last 2 million years. But if you talk about that same species in a climate that is, you know, two or four degrees warmer than present, those conditions haven't existed on Earth in the past, let's say, since about three million years ago. And so it's a really interesting question of uh, species have you know, native species on their native distributions. Those evolutionary lineages have experienced the colder conditions most likely, but they haven't experienced the warmer conditions. Yeah, well, and it seems like a lot of the research that I've been seeing that kind of looks at this, you know, what the, um, at least in the context of evolution, it seems like there's a much stronger evolutionary signal for uh, tolerance for high temperature. So that seems to be something that's actually uh, possibly an active, being actively selected for. Um, so in that paper that you mentioned, Town, I think one of the, one of the stronger signals was from temperature. Um, and so it's entirely possible that a lot of selective pressure is has been coming from that. And so that may be a very limiting fact that may, that suggests that that's going to be one of the more limiting factors, but who knows? Yep. Just going to have to wait 20 years and find out. <laughs> I guess we also have to 
to have in mind that our models they they look at macroecological uh, patterns, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, those changes in temperature are not necessarily for all species. The ones that they are actually experiencing in their in their at least the active periods of their days, because you know the, we we have been in the field and we have seen that certain species only goes. Uh, during the morning to do their job in the in the ecosystem or during the late afternoon or during the middle of the day if they are really tolerant to high temperatures. And then all those like behavior, the, the phenotypic plasticity of a species can allow them to probably maintain their populations in certain areas that are experiencing higher temperatures for the future or are going to help them do that. Uh, but we cannot actually see that from our models and, and we have to take that into account. Uh, because it's also true that although there's more pressure for evolution in the higher parts of the temperature variable, uh, it's also true that for that end of the physiological response, we have a, a, a limited factor that like at certain temperatures, certain proteins just stop working or, or they, they disintegrate, they, they change yeah. and for that 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 adds an, uh, an extra pressure most of the curves of tolerance that i have seen for some species are kind of truncated a little bit truncated in the higher part of the mm -hmm. so, so that indicates something like uh, but remember that this is biology and this is ecology this is a lot more complicated what just one type of model can tell you yeah. I I firmly believe that uh, we cannot predict the future with, with niche models. Uh, we can we can like identify trends of change, but uh, that you think that the map that you are getting out from, from the modeling is what is going to happen to the species, it's far away from true. Yeah. It's there are so so many so many variables acting at the same time in addition to the biology of, of species, that this is an oversimplifying uh, this complexity. So my recommendation always is that don't think that, that this uh, approach and, and niche models are going to, to tell you what's going to happen with species. I think what we can uh, find out with them is, is uh, the trend of change. If, this, uh, if conditions tend to, to become better or worse for the species in some area, but, but not that the species is going to go extinct or, or it's, it's going to expand or something like that. It's this, only tendency. This is scenario exploration rather than prediction. And you know, if you get very consistent results that are not detail, that are rather broad trends or broad picture, then they, they may actually indicate something that is likely to happen. But yeah, we're just exploring scenarios and, and basically saying, you know, if, if, the, if the climate changes in this way that is predicted by, by the general circulation models, then what would be the expected consequences for the, the distribution of this species? But you should not ever say, oh, no, 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 this pixel, it's gone. I predict that this, this population of this species is toast. No, that's, that's a prediction. And I don't, think, I don't think these models are anywhere near robust for that. The, the point that Marlon made a moment ago about how behavior can modulate this stuff, it's really, really important. Imagine you take, let's say, that scoloporous lizard mm -hmm. and you put a temperature sensor right here on the top of its head, right? If that temperature gets above, let's say, 40 degrees, our lizard's brain is cooked and it dies. But you guys have seen lizards, when it gets too hot, they go on the underside of the rock. That's right. Yeah. Or they start doing some cooling behavior or you know, whatever. Yeah. And so what you can imagine is 
that te temperature sensor on our, our lizard's head probably has some really well-defined limits that, you know, too hot, too cold, our lizard is dead. But then behavior allows our lizard to modulate those limits and maybe they get broader. You know, if it's 42 degrees out, then he goes under the rock. But if it's 42 degrees out 24 hours a day, then the temperature under that rock is going to be 42 degrees as well. Yeah, if or it's going to limit its ability to forage long enough to actually survive. Exactly. And so as, as I mean, yeah, behavior modulates from our, our, you know, millimeter scale temperature sensor out to something broader. And so we shouldn't expect our lizard to die immediately when mean annual temperature hits 42 degrees, but rather there should be some limit at some point as you go out to broader and broader temperature limits. And so we're studying this coarse grained version of physiology and the tie between the real physiology when, the, when those proteins denature or, or you know, homeostasis breaks down those limits are probably always stricter than the limits that we can detect with coarse-grained, temporally averaged measurements. And to add, I guess, insult to injury, <laughs> um, think about where our environmental variable, climatic variables come from. They come from meteorological stations out somewhere accessible, somewhere in a nicely cut field, not under a you know, tropical canopy or something like that. So, so our, our estimation of climates is quite different from what, what that lizard is experiencing this far above the ground in its particular habitat, not next to the meteorological station that recorded that temperature and precipitation. So we have the problem of, we are extrapolating from, from meteorological stations, we are getting those, those grids of uh, climatic data, but even though the, those points that are used to, to create the climatic um, rasters are not necessarily what organisms are, are experiencing so we are we are quite far from from what yeah enrique was saying we we are not predicting which populations will will um go off on a map will will uh, uh go extinct but I, I was gonna if if you are okay i was gonna suggest um uh, answering question 2709 because it is related to what you were saying, Enrique, and what we've been discussing so far. I mean, this is a simple, uh, not a simple, um, a clear case of an application. So we talked about uh, extrapolation, we talked about past, uh, present, future, but in the, you know, someone wants to use niche modeling for uh, a real world ap application. The question is what type of extrapolation could be, could be the more adequate if I'm trying to define cons uh, conservation areas in the future for a species. So I think it would be good, I don't know how much time we have, uh, if you want to, we haven't discussed collinearity at all, but um, maybe just a quick answer to this question. Um, and I don't know if we have a quick answer. <laughs> um, I would say I you do all the different ones and you say these are the possible outcomes and you have to, if you're engineering a conservation area, you need to keep it in mind that this is the possible broad range and maybe look at the core area that might be conserved among those three or something like yeah. that. But that would be Consider mine. the scenarios. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it's, yeah. It, go ahead. So go ahead. Going like for no extrapolation when when uh when i have a model and and no uh, there, i mean there are some algorithms that allow you to do that like saying to max and do not extrapolate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just don't don't like that option because in our world we need 
we need in our models we need we need some some way of extrapolating things because truncated truncated responses are, are not necessarily good yeah but, but i think that by using truncation as one like basically comparing what you get when you truncate versus what you get when you extrapolate i think that's good because that shows you like okay this is what we pretty much know is true based on what we know about the conditions in which the model was trained and then but if we want to talk about extrapolation that's an area that's a little more uncertain, but under the number of scenarios that we have or the way that we are the different algorithms that we have and like how those algorithms extrapolate, we know that somewhere out in this unknown zone, like um, there are known knowns and there are known unknowns. And this is a known <laughs> unknown. We're gonna, yeah, sorry. I guess I, I, guess I always, back down, but. <laughs> um, I guess I'll always use the mop. Like, George W. Bush is, is my best buddy these days compared to where we are right now. So yeah, that's that's very weird to hear. <laughs> I'm just gonna isolate that little clip of you saying George W. Bush is my <gasps> best buddy and keep it forever. It just says something about the current president. So later in the course, uh, in the frontiers section, we're gonna talk about fitting biologically realistic response types in niche modeling. And that's where, I mean, we've just said extrapolation as if it's one thing. Mm -hmm. But each one of these algorithms fits response types that can lead to certain types of extrapolation. So just as an example, with Maxent, if you leave it on default, if you have a high suitability at the limit of the calibration area in environmental space, then it reconstructs high suitability for all higher values. That's called clamping. That's very biologically unrealistic. If, they, if you have a clamped response in temperature, then that may say that your scoloporous lizard is completely happy at 100 degrees centigrade, whereas it's really boiled. So I think a very, very important frontier for this, this set of tools is to create algorithms, qualitatively new algorithms, that make assumptions about what real biological responses, what real fundamental niches should look like. OK, for example, from what we know about physiology, they ought to be complex, they ought to be convex. And they ought not to be complex. <laughs> right? And yet we use tools that fit things that are frequently not convex mm -hmm. and that are frequently very complex. So you're going to hear a talk from uh, Laura Jimenez and Jorge Soberon about fitting ellipsoids, but not just you know, a simple ellipsoid that encapsulates the, the known occurrences, but ellipsoids that take into account the availability of conditions. To me, that's a crucial frontier in this field. And as soon as those tools are mature, Whenever I am looking to fit a fundamental ecological niche model, I'm going to use those tools. There would be no reason to use Maxent or, or GAMS or, or regression trees or random forests because those things are fitting response types that don't look like fundamental niches. So in that sense, I'll agree with Marlon that extrapolation is good because we may only see this part of a fundamental niche, but our best biological assumptions about what fundamental niches look like may suggest that that niche extends over to here. And that would then moderate and modulate the climate change responses of our species. But, you know, ridiculous extrapolation like clamping or uncontrolled extrapolation it's obviously silly. So I think this is a question of what do our algorithms do 
And we should be thinking about how our algorithms deal with those extrapolative conditions. For example, Maxent has a nice quadratic response type. And so you can imagine that doing this. I like that. Okay, that's neat. That looks like a physiological response curve. Except that that quadratic response type can also give you a response that looks like this. It's a parabola. And that's exactly wrong. <laughs> so anyhow, um, look forward to that talk. It's going to be a neat one. And I think it has the, the, the potential to change this whole tool set radically. Okay, we are past an hour. Uh, anybody have any last comments? There are many uh, unanswered questions here, but uh, I will try to write them down. If you can, it's appreciated. Let me know if you add answers and I'll reprint the, the, uh, the matrix of questions and answers for people to look at. I will do so, at least those that, that are directed uh, to me, just to not let them end. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll be back next week, week 28, with, uh, with model comparisons. So take care, everybody around the world. <laughs>